Thank you for that introduction. I do appreciate it. And it's such an honor to be here at the Clinton School of Public Service. It truly is. There's several in the audience that I want to acknowledge, and then I want to get right into my remarks and make sure we have ample time for questions and answers. I hope you got some good questions, because I got some great answers. <laughs> and I really want to thank Skip Rutherford, the dean of this college and this effort. Uh, what a high honor for you, Skip, and what a terrific contribution you continue to make on behalf of President Clinton and so many others, all of you in this room, I suspect have a strong belief in the importance of public service. And she wouldn't be here today. <clears throat> and also to Nikolai uh, Di Pippa, who has sh shepherded me around here the last uh, while and has helped put all of this together. Thank you so much, uh, Nikolai, for your efforts on behalf of the school and the speaker's program, which I'm here to participate in today. Uh, I also have several leaders that I have grown to admire so much. Um, assistant to the President and Director of Intergovernmental Affairs at the White House for nearly four years. What's that? I often describe my job as the best non-elected position in the White House. I had the responsibility of working with all local and state elected officials. Can you just imagine? All the nation's governors, all the nation's mayors, and everything in between and below. And I had the good fortune of working for a president that believed these officials to be our partners in government and that it was our responsibility to be responsive to their concerns as we built support for the president's policy initiatives. And we have two former elected officials that I worked with that I want to thank for being here. Former mayor of North Little Rock, Patrick Hayes. Thank you so much, Pat, for your presence. Also for the former mayor of Little Rock, uh, the first African-American uh, mayor, I believe woman, uh, of Little Rock, Lottie Shackelford, who is here as well. So please join me in welcoming these two former mayors. And of course, Lottie continues uh, her contribution to the Democratic Party, serving as the caucus, the women's caucus chair, and has the distinction of having served 20 years as the DNC vice chair, longer than any vice chair in the history of the Democratic Party. That's quite an accomplishment. <laughs> and then I was so pleasantly uh, surprised to see Ann McCoy here with us. I was with Bob uh, taking a very interesting tour. You know, I've been here, I believe this is my fourth time, but all of the three previous visits to the library have been associated with events, and including the dedication of the library. Boy, did it rain, didn't it, Skip? <laughs> and uh, the 20th anniversary for President Clinton's announcement of his candidacy for president. And then most recently in November, where we all gathered for, to celebrate his uh, 25th year as assuming, uh, being elected president, rather, uh, of the United States, the 42nd president. So this was my first time where I actually got to walk around with Bob, just the two of us, <laughs> and actually see the library. And I loved it. I loved it. So again, thanks to the, <clears throat> the Clinton School of Public Service, Skip, for your invitation to be here. There is one other acknowledgement I want to make, and that's to my special friend, Norma Vega, who has joined me from Los Angeles to be here and currently serves the American Red Cross, Norma Vega, uh, with a very specific mission that is so important today. Go find our immigrant community at a time of disaster. Find out what they need from the American Red Cross and others, and go help them. How about that? The American Red Cross is waking up to all of that. Thank you. And by the way, I'm her official 
volunteer. <laughs> My remarks, I can boil it down into three things. You'll be glad to know that I haven't showed up with written remarks. I want to share my pledge. I want to share my story. And I want to conclude with my book. And I want time left over for you to ask questions, whether it's about my experience at the White House, whether it's current issues impacting the Latino community today. We live in challenging times as a community and as a country. So my hope is that you'll have some questions for me at the conclusion of my remarks that we can learn from each other. First, my pledge. You know, I have now reached the point in my career over 40 years of a professional career. 40 years. You know, I started my career at the top, at the top, as a teacher of at-risk high school students in the public schools of Utah, my home state. <laughs> Do we have the Arkansas Education Association here? Thank you so much for being here. I then went on to serve the National Education Association, AEA being the state, proud state affiliate of the NEA here locally, for 16 years, 16 years, serving in its political and government relations division, eventually becoming the political manager, campaigns and elections manager of the NEA, and my connection to Governor Bill Clinton and later President Clinton. And then on to the White House, on to the White House for nearly four years as an assistant to the President. Then opening my own business, something I never planned to do. Never planned to do. And yet, thanks to my younger brother, who had always been in business, he's only 11 months younger than I am, they live a better life in Utah. He looks 11 years younger than me, I swear. And convinced me that I could do this. I could do this. I could open the first Latino-owned public affairs and government relations firm in our nation's capital. You could do this. And we have. And today, we are now in our 17th year of business. I don't know if somebody's adding all these years up. But I think I've crossed the 40-year line. And now also with the nonprofit organization that I have founded and chair, we've begun our 14th year as the Latino Leaders Network, dedicated to a simple mission, difficult to achieve, bringing leaders together. Bringing leaders together. And in some respects, Skip, I see the Clinton School of Public Service with that mission as well, bringing leaders together to address problems. In our case, we bring leaders together through two signature events, the Latino Leaders Luncheon Series, four times a year, and the Tribute to Mayors, twice a year, where we get an opportunity to shine the light on a mayor that's doing right by the Latino community. And that can be an African-American mayor, it can be a white mayor, it can be a Latino mayor, it can be an Asian mayor. I love the Antonio Villarigosa Leadership Award, the former mayor of Los Angeles and former president of the United States Conference of Mayors, because every mayor in America is eligible for this award if they do right by our community. And then our second signature event, the Latino Leaders Luncheon Series, where we honor a leader that is willing to share their story of obstacles overcome to achieve success. Our stories are important and they need to be told. I'm going to come back to the book before we close. I'm going to transition now 
to really the, the point that I'm making about my pledge. After all of that experience, you know what I realized I am? I'm a professional advocate. That's what I've done for 40 years for students, for teachers and other educational employees, for President Clinton and those of us at the, at the White House that was trying to put people first again, for my clients in Washington, D.C. that have a host of objectives and goals to accomplish, and of course now the Latino community, my community, through the Latino Leaders Network. I have made a pledge to use every opportunity possible for the remaining years that God gives me here to share what I have learned along the way. Shame on me if I leave this earth not doing all that I can through speaking, here I am, through writing, and through teaching again to share the lessons that others may find helpful to their careers and addressing their goals and objectives for making a better country, a better world, a better community. That's my pledge, and that's what drove me here today. My story. I was an assistant to the President of the United States before I ever mustered the courage to share my story. And I credit President Clinton for helping me understand the importance of our stories. We each have one. Each of us have one. President Clinton shared his story often. And for me, I was first attracted to Governor Clinton when he announced his candidacy and introduced his bio via video, the first presidential candidate ever to do so. The first. You can still Google it. You know what the name of it is? The Man from Hope where he tells his story. He told it often at the White House, and as I observed its impact on the audiences, both at the White House and beyond, I realized it was important for me to share my story. My father, Francisco Nicolás Santiago Ibarra, came to this country in 1945 from Oaxaca, Mexico a Zapotec, Indio. Spanish was his second language. As a bracero, for those that aren't aware, the bracero program was a farm, primarily a farm labor program, an agreement between the United States Department of Labor and its counterpart in Mexico to bring Mexican laborers to the United States to literally harvest the crops during World War II to feed our nation while our men and women were engaged in battle. Francisco Ibarra came to Spanish Fork, Utah to pick fruit. He went on to work at the railroad and then he landed a job at Kennecott Copper Mine outside of Salt Lake City. A union job, a miner, a miner. Better benefits, more pay, more job security. He was a very happy man. He married my mother, who was white, Mormon, blonde, and 16 years old. In Salt Lake City in the early 50s, that was not a sociably acceptable thing to do. And by the time I was two, by then my brother 
had come along 11 months younger, the predictable occurred. They divorced. And David and I were raised for the most of the first 15 years of our life in foster care, placed by the Children's Service Society of Utah, who, by the way, just in February, I had the privilege of delivering the keynote address at their annual fundraising gala to talk about the good that they've done for so many children in Utah, including David and Mickey Ibarra. It's really fascinating to observe how children react to difficult circumstances. Same mother and father, my brother and I had very different reactions. My brother was so afraid. I would say, not an exaggeration, to say traumatized by our foster experience. I remember in school, in grade school, he would uh, refuse to participate, would run out of the classroom, head for the men's room, the boys' room. They would always come and get me to talk him out of his tree and get him back into class. Just a very difficult time, and it didn't get better. It didn't get better. I remember the question that David would dread the most, and me as well, so, your last name is Ibera. There was no such thing as Ibarra in Salt Lake City then. Ibera. So why are you living with the Smiths? And you know that simple question had a very negative impact on my brother. Me to a lesser degree, but to my brother. Whoever asked that question would never ask it a second time. If there were kids on the playground, man, it was over for them. And he kept getting in deeper and deeper and deeper trouble. Fortuitously, at 15, we were given the opportunity to go visit my father. Francisco Ibarra, the miner, got drafted during the Korean conflict, returned to Kennecott Copper Mine with an invaluable new benefit, the GI Bill for education. He cashed it in at the Hollywood Beauty College in Salt Lake City. He became a hairstylist. Left Salt Lake City for Sacramento, where we had family members there, I came to find out. And he opened his dream, his own business, the Mona Lisa House of Beauty. And for nearly 30 years, Francisco Ibarra employed a lot of people in the beauty salon. We had the opportunity to join him for a week. It was to be a little vacation. Well, my brother lit into him from day one about the absolute necessity for him to allow us to move to Sacramento with him. Because he was not going to make it there. In the end, Dad agreed with one condition, that Mickey and you, David, have to do this together. You've never been separated before, and you're not going to be separated now. 
after lots of consideration, primarily about my brother's future, I agreed that we needed to leave, and we left. We packed all of our stuff in boxes and mailed them, U.S. Postal Service, <laughs> to Sacramento and got on a Greyhound bus. I can tell you that is one of the most important crossroads in my life, reuniting with my father in Sacramento in 1966. It was there that my brother and I discovered our identity. In Utah, we knew something was different, but really didn't know what it was. In Sacramento, living with my father, being introduced to our culture and our family, and even our food, was a terrific and important experience. It saved my brother, there's no question in my mind. David went on to become president of our junior class in high school. Well, I served as president of our high school class and was voted most likely to succeed. And this was a big step for us. This was a 3,000 student high school, Luther Burbank, home of the mighty Titans. And my father, who I come to understand who's made mistakes in his life, to be sure, did the right thing and stood up like a father should. And from my father, David and I learned two very, very valuable lessons. The value of hard work. Wow. I've never seen a man work as hard as my dad every day. He owned a beauty salon and had a second job early in the morning, they call them lumpers then, unloading the Safeway trucks of produce. And secondly, I've never met a man more proud of being Mexican than Francisco Ibarra and Zapotec. That really, really, I think, helped my brother connect with who we are. Now, I went on from Sacramento, attended college, I've gone through my career, really a terrific opportunity. I could never have imagined, and I must confess, never ever imagined being asked to join the president at the White House. It just wasn't something I ever thought would be possible. And I said no twice. fear of failure, my love for the National Education Association, and yet President Clinton and his chief of staff, Erskine Bowles, would not take no for an answer. And they give me the opportunity of a lifetime. And that is where I'll identify the second crossroads that made all the difference in my life. But yeah, you can do this. I remember having a call, Skip, with then Secretary of uh, Housing and Urban Development, Henry Cisneros. I've been offered this position. What should I do? We cannot, as a community, stand on the outside, banging on the door, and then when someone opens it, refuse to walk in and take charge. So that helped me get real clear about my responsibility, but also about the opportunity that was being provided, not for only Mickey Barra, but for our community, and to also assist President Clinton fulfill his vision of America and in a White House 
that looked just like America. The diversity that uh, really, I think, is a, is a trademark, a unique trademark of the Clinton administration. I share my story in part simply to help others understand that it's not always required to come from privilege or to come from advantage. That through a good education, working hard, surrounding yourself with good people, and with some good old-fashioned luck, you too can accomplish your dreams. I say that if it happened to me, it can happen to you. Our young people in this room, it can. And I'm proof of that. My pledge to share what I've learned along the way as often as I can with those that are willing to show up to listen. Secondly, my story. And thirdly, my book. See, it fits. My observation of President Clinton who helped teach me the power of our personal stories. The formation of the Latino Leaders Network that provided a platform for leaders willing to share their story with all of us. We now, by the way, just finished our 53rd event of the Latino Leaders Luncheon Series in San Jose. Nearly 300 guests for lunch at the Fairmont, where we honored President Clinton's former Deputy Chief of Staff, Maria Echeveste. We have taken now 33 keynote addresses delivered at the Latino Leaders Luncheon Series to really demonstrate the truth. You know, in today's political back and forth, there is a very negative narrative being promulgated from the White House and too many other locations about the Latino community. This is the truth. 33 heroes, 33 role models, 33 outstanding leaders. It's my hope, it's our hope, the Latino Leaders Network, that readers of our book will be inspired to dream big, to get prepared, and get ready to lead. Now, I notice we've got some book sales here. I'm hoping that you'll take a look at this, and regardless of whether you decide to purchase it or not, what's most important to me, would you be willing to ask those who are book buyers. This book ought to be available in every Little Rock library and school. It ought to be. And our goal is to make sure that it is, not only in Little Rock, but from coast to coast. Take a look. We do have leaders. We do have role models. We do have heroes. So please take a look and see if you can help us spread the good word. Now, for questions and answers, let's have some fun. Q&A. Yeah, let's do some Q&A. <laughs> okay, Skip. Let's go. Nora, you gonna be first? Come on, Nora. Ask the, ask, ask the, ask, got it. you gotta ask him the DACA question. Come on, Nora, put you on the spot. Hi, my name is Nora Viñas. I'm a first year student. Wow. Um, I'm originally from Colombia. I was raised in Miami. Okay. So my question to you is, um, with the current climate around immigration and Trump's decision to rescind DACA and now all the tweets that happened on Easter saying that DACA is dead, what, what do you think we should do? How, how are you going to move forward personally with your... Um, strategic group and your foundation, what are you going to do to help DACA recipients? And those that didn't qualify for DACA. Yes. I think the reality is this. We're stuck in a very hard place with a president and a Congress that seems unwilling 
and perhaps incapable of addressing an obvious issue of fairness and humanity. The reality is we need to change the leadership in Washington, D.C. We've got to do that. We've got to do that. I am encouraged. I am encouraged by what you're observing, what I'm observing, what I'm feeling as I go around the country. The people are getting prepared to take their nation back. And I think that is so important. The recent engagement of our young people, yes, through the gun violence issue, but I think there'll be a lot more issues on the ballot than the gun issue, and that's an important one. But the fact that there is a hundred thousand young people that have pre-registered to vote in the state of California, that is very important. And we need to replicate that kind of engagement you know, from coast to coast. The fact is, and again, I, I must confess, I, well, I'm an optimist. There are some that still call me a bit Pollyannish, and I'm okay with that. I promised myself that I ever got cynical in Washington, it was time for me to leave. Well, I'm still there, and I intend to stay there. And what I intend to do is to encourage all those that I have the opportunity to, to speak with, we must get engaged. What we're sure of, is there will be another election in this country. And one is coming in November. It's very important. And it will be followed by a presidential election in 2020. And i got to believe, i got to believe, that we will have more people ready to engage to make a difference than we've seen in a long, long time. And that's the silver lining in a very, I think, uh, dark cloud. I wish I could offer you more optimistic advice in the short term, but I think the reality is in November and two years from November. We've got to stand up and make a difference. Now, let me also use this opportunity to share something with you that some leaders, particularly Latino leaders, aren't particularly comfortable sharing. We have a huge mass of Latinos in this country that are eligible to vote if they would register, and they haven't. I'm talking a significant number. The good news is, once Latinos register to vote, they're showing up at about 80%, about 80 percent, 78 percent. The reality is there are 57 percent of Latinos that are not bothering to register and to show up to vote. We have to take some responsibility in our community, and our young leaders can be very helpful in this with their families and with others. We have got to step up and get engaged civically to ever have a chance to ensure that elect officials start making decisions that are good for all of us, not just some of us. Yeah, here comes the microphone at you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You have answered the question I had okay. about the voting, because this is a reality. Yes. And, and it's not only the Latinos. I mean, if you take history of elections, only about 57, 55 percent of registered uh, voters yes. have gone to, the, to vote, which in my mind is ridiculous, because if 50 percent divided by almost half and half both parties, means that this country is run by 25% of the voters. Yes. My question is, uh, I've been uh, involved in several Latino organizations, LULAC and so on, and we having difficulty to get young leaders to take over. Mm. We, the old guard, needs to get out and leave space. What do we do, based on your experience, to really motivate young Latinos to take over, to take charge? Yeah. Well, I'm now thinking of my high school teacher. Mr. Steinberg was my government teacher. And you know, while I was at the White House, I had an opportunity to write him a letter to thank him for helping me understand, as a young man, the importance of fulfilling my civic civic responsibility. He gave us extra credit 
for showing up at city council meetings, for showing up at campaign events, for showing up at the school board. Extra credit. It was that that really helped me show up. By the way, I have a, my first book. Mickeyisms. 30 Tips for Success. By the way, if there's anybody in this room who would like to have a free signed copy of Mickeyisms, all that's required is to send me an email and your mailing address. I want, that's a requirement. And that email address is Mickey. How do you spell that? What? M I C K E Y. <laughs> at Ibarra, Ibarra, I B as in boy, A R R A, strategy.com. One word, IbarraStrategy.com. One tip number four, show up. Show up. 80% of success in life I've discovered is just showing up <laughs> again and again and again. And that's a lot about politics. I think we do have to really provide an opportunity for our young people to engage. There's a second part of this, and I think we need to do a lot better job, perhaps, of listening, of listening to their concerns, their plans, their desires, their ideas, and to be partners in all of that. Uh, I think that partnership is what we're struggling for. But we have so many young people. The Latino community is the long, youngest ethnic community in the country. My gosh, what an opportunity we have. And we have to figure out ways to where we are in the same room together and how it is that we can assist our young people achieve the objectives and goals uh, through, I think, our joint civic responsibility. We've got to do that. There's no easy answer. There's no simple fix. And yet I am encouraged. I am encouraged with the rise up of our young people as it relates to gun violence and their demand of their leaders to take some responsibility for protecting them in school. I think it is possible for us to make a difference together. The older generation, I like to call it the establishment maybe, <laughs> and, and our younger generation that really are the future of this country. But let me just say I am encouraged. I am encouraged. Um, our young people and the students in this room have so much to offer us. And listening is very much a part of leadership. Mickey, you uh, <clears throat> also practice what you preach. I know that. I've watched that a long time. Tell this group about your newest senior associate. Wow. This, yes. And, 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 and the age of that, quote, senior associate. Yes. Background. Yes, yes, yes. You know, as I opened my new business, and that, by the way, uh, my, I left the White House one day, opened my new business the second day, and one of the things I didn't fully appreciate was how much enjoyment, how much reward I would receive from providing employment opportunities and education opportunities through my own business. I get to do all the hiring. I mentioned to Karen earlier, who is from Columbia, and her mother, who's here with us. I'm delighted she's here as well. Today, April 9th, was the first day of my new senior associate, Felipe Hoyos, whose parents immigrated to this country from Colombia. Now, how ironic is that? And that's not the first Colombian that has worked for me. Joel Salazar currently works for me on a part-time basis, assisting with our database, and I've had a third uh, Colombian, Luis Campillo, who now has left me after six years as working in Los Angeles for AARP. And I could go on and on, but this is such a wonderful opportunity. Part of your answer, part of the answer to your question, is providing our young people with an opportunity to be mentored, to be taught, to be assigned to go get it done. The Ibarra Strategy Group has helped me provide an opportunity to many as employees, 
I mean, let me tell you, when I showed up in Washington, D.C. in 1984, there was no such thing as an Ibarra strategy group. Are you kidding? That was unheard of. Another point, Skip, that I know you appreciate, the value of internships. Today, my 18th intern, Latino intern, many Latinas as well, my 18th at the University of Utah, who have joined me as paid interns over these 14 years. So that is a really an important, I think, responsibility and contribution that our business community has to provide also as opportunity for our young people. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, they say I have to have three years of experience. But Mr. Ibarra, how am I going to get three years of experience if nobody will hire me until I have three years of experience? It's kind of a catch-22, isn't it? So, so how, opening up those opportunities. So tell them how old your senior associate is, the one you just Oh, talked. thank you, yes. 28 years old. 28 years old. And he now, by the way, until Friday, worked on the staff of Senator Bill Nelson of Florida, United States Senate. We have more young people in Washington, D.C. looking for opportunity than ever before. And I am so proud of them, and I'm always delighted. Not so delighted to see someone leave, but you know, as, as difficult as that is, particularly when they're doing an outstanding job, as the previous person that held this position was, I remind myself, my gosh, what a great opportunity for someone new to come and learn about this business of advocacy. It's great. Okay, we've got a question over here. We've got one back here. Yep. The, the Latino community, in, and especially in Little Rock, Arkansas, is relatively young in comparison yes. to Chicago or what have you. And I volunteer with the Democratic Party, and one of the things that I've always struggled with is kind of connecting both sides, right? So the Latinos say, <clears throat> yeah, well, they don't do anything for me. And then the Democrats say, yeah, well, those people don't vote. And I'm like, well, if, if, if they don't come out and vote, they're not going to do anything for you. So it's almost like a disconnect of how do we bring the two. So what are some tips or strategies to galvanize the people to come out and vote, but also to let the candidates know, all right, there's 25,000 Hispanics in the second congressional district in Little Rock. How do you motivate your staff to go and get those votes? Yeah. Well, one, there's no single answer. There's no single answer. It requires a whole host of effort. And I'd suggest this. The good news is this. We have more media, more platform to communicate with each other than ever before. Ever. I mean, my gosh, it's astounding how many folks you can communicate with, with a single tweet or a Facebook post and so on and so forth. So one, I think, is to continue to mine and learn about the power and use of social media to engage. We've got to figure out how to engage. I happen to believe that when you get the opportunity to share with others the importance of this engagement for not only themselves, that may be important enough for a lot, but for also our community and our country, I think we've got a good chance to get them to change behavior, to go register, to get educated on the issues and make an intelligent, informed vote. Uh, I think we can do that. And by the way, I'm very confident, uh, I'm sure you agree, Lottie, that if they get all the facts, they're going to make the right choice. They're going to make the right choice. But we've got to look for ways to engage them. Secondly, we've also got to look for a way to listen better than we do. Listen. My gosh, if one of the things that we've learned from our last presidential election is perhaps, perhaps we didn't do as good a job as we should have and could have to listen, to listen. So I think that's very important too. We've got to understand it's not just about talking, it's also you know, about listening. Um, there is no easy answer. A third piece, I'll leave it with this, and that is government action. How, how can government make me vote? <laughs> government cannot make you vote and shouldn't. That happens in some democracies. <laughs> And this isn't one of them. And government is not helpless in creating an environment that makes it easier to vote. For example, we have leadership from California. 
Secretary of State Alex Padilla. What is he, Norma? How, many, how old is he? Maybe 38, if that. MIT graduate Alex Padilla worked with the state legislature of California recently passed legislation that has been signed by Governor Brown that now automatically register every person that comes in for a driver's license unless you opt out. It used to be the reverse. You used to have to opt in. You used to have to register when you get your, you know, you didn't have to, but they would allow you to. No, now it's different. Now you are automatically registered unless you say, I don't want to be registered. So there is government action that can be taken, I think, to also make it easier to vote. Got a question right here, Susanna. Hi, thanks for being here. Uh, as somebody who started your career off as an educator, I couldn't let the opportunity go by uh, to get your thoughts on the uh, teacher strikes around the U.S. I'm smiling from ear to ear. <laughs> you know, my first job uh, with the National Education Association I mentioned in Washington, I was brought there in 1984, was to help educators understand the intersection where politics and policy meet, where they meet that they are inextricably linked, and that we as teachers need to understand that our job goes beyond the classroom. If we care about the kids and the condition of education, we have got to hit the streets. We have got to get involved in determining who those elected officials are and to advocate before or against legislation being proposed. Let me make it personal. I have two grandchildren, two grandchildren. Never thought I'd be a grandfather, but I am. Two. Lily Jane, who about, is about to turn 10 on April 27th, and Gabriel, who is 12, both enrolled in the Phoenix Public Schools. And I have been delighted to see their mother's reaction and her neighbor's reaction to, yes, those teachers are right and also recognize that it's not just teachers fighting for a living wage, but they're also fighting for textbooks and for other important supplies that are basic and the need to reduce class size. These states that are rising up, Oklahoma, Arizona, uh, West Virginia, others, I say about time, and it is a wonderful lesson and civic engagement to observe our teachers lead the way. So thank you. Mickey, one final question. Mm -hmm. The, <clears throat> and I believe we had a discussion about yes. this many years ago. Um, the Republican Party used to actually carry the Latino vote, did well for many years um, over. Do you see a, a, a way, given the environment where we are, that, that there are Republicans, for example, like George P. Bush and others, uh, that can bring the Latino vote more, uh, distributed more equally among the Republican Party, because the Democratic, at least the percentage numbers, look just off the chart these days. Yes. You, well, do you see any movement back? I don't. And in fact, it's worse than that. At the top of the Republican ticket, I don't see much interest in the Latino vote. Maybe I've missed something. <laughs> but I believe that um, we have a president of the United States today that is really using the Latino community and his actions and negative comments to really motivate his base. A result of that, I think, it's for great concern among establishment Republicans that realize this is a far cry from the presidency of George W. Bush. While he didn't receive a majority, received a very strong vote from the Latino community. That's not the vote that Donald Trump en enjoyed uh, in 2016. And I expect with the increased engagement of the Latino community, we're gonna see even a larger spread 
in the support. I mean, the Latino community is smart enough to figure out who is on their side. They are, and they will. What we have to do is figure out how to get them registered, point them in the right direction, and, uh, and make a difference. We can do that. One final thing, your thoughts on Puerto Rico. Well, you know, uh, I mentioned our tribute to mayors. Tribute to mayors. We just convened the 28th tribute to mayors in Washington, D.C. at the Mayflower Hotel on January 25th to honor the mayors of Puerto Rico. The mayors of Puerto Rico who through their leadership during Hurricane Maria I think really have demonstrated leadership under very difficult circumstances. I am absolutely having, again, I mentioned my role at the White House Intergovernmental Affairs, but let me also hasten to add that in addition to local and state elected officials, we were also responsible for all U.S. territories, and that included Puerto Rico. And I can tell you this, that I learned more about Puerto Rico and its history and its very, very uh, contested politics uh, than I ever uh, had any idea or realized. I can tell you that the United States government has failed Puerto Rico. I don't believe that is in any way an overstatement. We have failed Puerto Rico. We have failed a U.S. territory and nearly four million Latinos that are citizens of this country. If this disaster occurred in New Orleans, Houston, and the rest of the places, so many places in our country, the response, I believe, would have been very dramatically different than what we've seen in Puerto Rico. Shame on us. And it doesn't have to remain that way. It does not. Change comes through election. Change comes through electing elected officials that will do the right thing, the responsible thing. And we don't have to wait till the election. We should be <clears throat> continuing to advocate for our brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico every day. Well, I encourage you to come purchase Latino Leaders Speak and visit with Mickey because we've just heard from a great Latino <laughs> leader. And Mickey, I'm so glad uh, that you have come to the Clinton School to share your stories and your Thank life you. with us. Thank Let's you. give Mickey a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. Uh, I want to give a picture.